much. And do keep uh, Mark chapter 14 uh, on page 1021 open, as we'll be referring to it a number of times. But before we study this passage together, let me pray this prayer for each one of us. I'm going to use the words of an old chorus. Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Speak just now. Some message to meet my need, which thou only dost know. Speak now through thy holy word, and make me see some wonderful truth thou hast to show to me. Amen. I wonder whether we think of prayer as something for uh, everyday use, uh, or something just for emergencies. Uh, to use a, a driving analogy, uh, is prayer our steering wheel, or maybe just the spare wheel? Uh, the missionary James Hudson Taylor preferred a musical uh, analogy. He put it like this, Christians, he said, getting on with their day without prayer is rather like musicians having their concert first and then tuning their instruments later. I think I can resonate with that one. So in this passage before us this morning, I'd like us to come to it to learn about the importance of prayer. So we're going to consider first the disciples at prayer and the results of that, and secondly, Jesus at prayer and the results of that. So first, I'd like us to listen to the disciples at prayer. What can we hear? Uh, nothing, actually, except maybe some discreet snoring. It's not that they're too busy or too fearful, it's just they're too sleepy. Yet they'd receive both a warning and an instruction from Jesus. The warning is in verse 27. You will all fall away, Jesus says, quoting a prophecy from Zechariah. And the instruction comes in verse 32. Sit here while I pray. But what happens? Five verses later, verse 37, Jesus returns and finds them sleeping. Verse 37, could you not watch one hour, Jesus asks. Now, whenever God asks us a direct question, it's always important to think why he does so. Remember the first question that God asked of a man, also, by the way, in a garden. Genesis 3, but the Lord God called to, the, to, call to Adam, where are you? Did God not know where Adam was? Sure, as the previous verse rather quaintly puts it, Adam was hiding from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Hiding from God? You see, the all-knowing God asks us a question not to elicit information for himself, but usually to elicit honesty from us. So when on a day about 12 years ago, God asked of me, are you ready to die? He didn't ask out of curiosity. He asked to issue to me a much needed challenge. And so here, could you not watch one hour? Well, it was obvious they couldn't. But Jesus needs to awaken them to the fact, quite literally. And now he gives them a more specific instruction. If we look at verse 38, watch and pray so that you do not fall into temptation. Jesus goes off again to pray and returns a second time. Verse 40, he again found them sleeping and they did not know what to say to him. Surely this must be one of the most ultimate of embarrassing silences. But we might be asking, well... You know, what's wrong with 40 winks? But, but this was not carelessness. This was disobedience. You would have thought, indeed, that the circumstances themselves would have driven the disciples to prayer. It was, after all, a fairly desperate time. And in desperation, even many an unbeliever might be driven to prayer. But it's just as Jesus remarks to them in verse 38. The Spirit is willing but the body, the flesh, is weak. I do hope we know ourselves well enough not to be fooled by our good intentions. I know I'm often the same as the disciples. I don't believe my own weaknesses. 
And so I constantly face spiritual danger unprepared. We have such a high opinion of ourselves. We're so full of good intentions. But like the disciples, we fail our Lord again and again. Indeed, the disciples' prayerlessness and weakness is a painful reminder of why Jesus has to go through and go to the cross to pay the price of their sin and ours. And then by verses 41 and 42, well, of course, it's gone beyond the time for prayer. If we look at those verses, 41, 42, returning a third time, Jesus says to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough, the hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go, here comes my betrayer. And do we remember those overly hasty promises in verse 31? But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And it wasn't just Peter, just read on, and all the others said the same. And now they've got to deliver on those promises. And what do we find? Well, first in verse 47, there is Peter's infamous one-sided duel as he lops off the ear of the high priest's servant. What was Peter thinking of? What was he trying to do? But how easy it is to be out of step with Christ when we think we're serving him, even defending him. Chopped off any ears lately? Is there any blood on the ground from a blow that you or I have self-righteously and wrongly inflicted? even maybe on a fellow Christian. The story is told of, of a dispute between two prominent 19th century preachers, Newman Smith and Robert Hall. A controversy arose between the two over some religious point, with Smith writing a bitter pamphlet denouncing Hall and his doctrine. Having finished the pamphlet, with which he was rather pleased, Smith was having trouble coming up with a good title. So he sent the booklet to a friend asking for a suggestion. Sometime earlier, Smith had written a widely acclaimed evangelistic pamphlet entitled, Come to Jesus. When his friend had read the new pamphlet, with its vitriolic attack on Hall, he sent it back with the following note. The title I suggest for your pamphlet is, Go to Hell by the author of Come to Jesus. Mercifully, the pamphlet was never published. We all need friends like that. And then we see the second result of the disciples' prayerlessness in those six somewhat pathetic words which constitute verse 50. Then everyone deserted him and fled. And that should be enough, my friends, to send us to our knees saying, Lord, Make me to be more prayerful. Bishop Ryle puts it thus, Prayer is where true religion begins. Here it flourishes and here it decays. Tell me what a man's prayers are, says Ryle, and I will tell you the state of his soul. Lord Jesus, help me to be more prayerful. But thankfully, the disciples are not center stage in this drama because actually this story is not really about them. It's about Christ at prayer. And so we can move on. Billy Bray was a 19th century Cornish tin miner and part-time preacher. And he used to begin every working day with the following prayer. Lord, if someone must die today, let it be me. I'm ready. Now, it wasn't that he had suicidal tendencies. It was just that he was someone who knew that he was right with God, and so he would rather be the one to die as opposed to one of his unconverted friends. Bishop Hugh Latimer was martyred in Oxford in 1555 at the age of 80. And like Jesus, he knew that his death was coming. He was to be burnt for his faith. And this is what he prayed just before he died. I thank God most heartily that he hath prolonged my life to this end, that I may in this case glorify God with this kind of death. 
Now, I mention these two examples because they are Christian disciples who, if I might put it this way, died well. So I'm puzzled when I read in our passage of Christ's heaviness, of his anguish, of his sorrow, so deep in verse 34 that it, it almost kills. Because I know of disciples who died better, who died more positively. So why is this? What caused Christ's agony? The cross? Well, not just the cross. It was the shattering reality that he was, as Paul will put in his second letter to the Corinthians, about to be made sin for us who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You see, Jesus is sinless. He detests sin, but he's going to bear our sin and punishment. That's the agony, as Jesus is about to become our substitute, the only sacrifice that can pay the price of our sin. But it's just so unbearingly poignant, is it not, as Christ's loneliness in the garden fulfills many Old Testament prophecies. Psalm 69, reproach has broken my heart. I am full of heaviness. Or Isaiah 53, he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And then there's another question. Why did Jesus feel the need for such intense and lengthy prayer? And I think our passage suggests that it was because of the... He felt the force of temptation, the temptation not to conform with his Father's will, either to leave his atoning work undone or else to seek its accomplishment by some other means. But the lesson here for us is not so much the nature of Christ's temptation, though ours can at times be similar, to avoid God's work, to attempt to do it in a way other than his way, to feel perhaps abandoned by God, but rather the lesson is to learn from Christ's utter dependence upon prayer. Do we value prayer this much? Do we pray as earnestly? Or do we just sleep on like the disciples? One hymn writer puts it like this. <clears throat> Go to dark Gethsemane, you that feel the tempter's power. Your Redeemer's conflict see, watch with him one bitter hour. Turn not from his griefs away, learn of Jesus Christ to pray. And then we come to that most human of pleas our Lord utters in verse 36, in what surely must be the pivotal verse of Mark's Gospel. Look, with it, look at it with me if you will. Abba, Father. Take this cup from me. And if one has been reading through Mark's gospel with its promise of Jesus being the perfect and complete sacrifice in, for sin, then suddenly here in the 36th verse of the 14th chapter, Jesus is asking, do I have to? Maybe, Father, there's another way. And the whole of humankind, were it listening to this drama, should collectively be holding its breath as literally salvation hangs in the balance. As Jesus asks his father, take this cup from me. But just before we go on, we must ask what Jesus means by this cup. It's not just death, it's not just the cross, it's an Old Testament imagery. It's a reference to the cup of God's judgment, of God's wrath. Here's Isaiah writing again. Awake, awake, rise up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, you who have drained to its dregs the goblet that makes men stagger. That's the cup, the cup of God's righteous and holy wrath against your sin and mine. You see, God's wrath isn't like mine. It's not a sort of selfish flying off the handle. It's a settled opposition to all that is evil. And the opposite of God's kind of wrath would be indifference. And so 
if you struggle over the concept of God's wrath, then we need to ask ourselves this question. Would we want, would you want to worship a God who was indifferent to sin and evil, who at the end said, well, it just doesn't matter? Could you or I worship a morally indifferent God? But back, if we may, to Jesus' plea, take this cup from me. After all, we're still holding our breath for the answer, for surely if we realize the full implication and the unique importance of the cross, then our heart is in our mouth at this point. But you see, that's not all Jesus says. Look again with me, if you will, at verse 36. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. This is Jesus at prayer, aligning his will with his Father's. Is there any other way, Jesus asks, any other way to, to affect man's pardon and righteousness other than by the cross? Yet not what I will, but what you will. And that one word, yet, this is what our whole eternal salvation depends on. And God's answer is, there is no other way. And so how wrong we are when we presume to imply that there are other ways, that sinful mankind can be, as the hymn puts it, pardoned, healed, restored, forgiven, apart from through the cross of Christ. And when we do that, we are making a wicked nonsense of Gethsemane. Yet surely when we hear Christ's prayer proceed to that second half of verse 36, we should want to say, thank God that Jesus chose the cross. For my salvation, my eternity, hung on those very words and moments, as did yours. Jesus chose the cross, and in the words of the communion service, made there, by his one oblation of himself once offered, a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. And there is absolutely nothing that you and I can add to that. Not, of, not of course, that we don't try. I think it's true to say that when men go to get their hair cut, uh, the conversation with, between the cutter and the customer uh, often re revolves around a sport uh, or politics uh, or religion. Well, there's a story about a committed Christian who was having his hair cut and the conversation had got on to the Christian gospel with the customer explaining the simple truths of the gospel uh, to the barber, including how that on the cross Jesus accomplished everything necessary for our salvation. But the barber is a practicing Catholic and he was having none of it. Oh, that can't be right, he said. I have to do things to get right with God. I have to go to Mass every Sunday. No, you don't, the customer said. Going to Mass doesn't make you right with God. Jesus has done all that on the cross. It's been done. It's finished. But the barber protested. Oh, no, no, I have to go to confession as well. No, insisted the customer. It's all finished. It's all done. No, that just can't be right, said the barber again as he finished cutting the man's hair and held up the mirror for the man to admire uh, the superb handiwork. When suddenly the customer grabs a pair of scissors and starts hacking at his own hair. No, stop, the barber shouts. It's finished, it's done, you'll only spoil it. Yes, precisely, says the customer. It's finished, it's done. You'll only spoil it. And my friends, it's not only our Catholic brothers and sisters who try to add to the cross of Christ. What might we say? I help welcome, I help serve coffee on a Sunday morning. I attend the church prayer meetings. I read my Bible. I serve on the church council. I pray. And I'm so glad if you do. But when we start trusting in what we do, rather than trusting in what Christ has already done, then we're making a mockery of Gethsemane. 
So what should we take from this passage this morning? Three things I would suggest. First, that it is a great comfort to know that Jesus faced such times of testing as he did here in Gethsemane. As the writer to the Hebrews puts it, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Let us then approach the throne of grace in prayer with confidence so that we may receive mercy and grace to help in time of need. Can we find a friend so faithful? Who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Second, the way Jesus endured testing was through prevailing prayer. And often that phrase, prevailing in prayer, is used as though it means that we have to keep at prayer until God at last does what we want him to do. But I hope we've noticed that that isn't how Christ prevailed in prayer in the garden. He kept at prayer until, and I'm speaking of Christ's humanity here, until his will was conformed to God's will. For that is the victory. It is as Francis, Francis Ridley Havergal has it in her hymn, Take my will and make it thine. For we shall have troubles, we shall have temptations, crosses to bear, but we will have the victory only when through a submission of our will to God in prayer, we embrace with willing hearts whatever it is that God has for us. And in that case, it will not be our will versus God as it was for the first Adam in the Garden of Eden, but rather it will be our will and God's together as was the case here with the second Adam in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that is how you and I can really know the reality of prevailing prayer. And finally, I hope our hearts are overflowing with thankfulness to him who willingly chose the cross and that we shall express that in words of wonder and of joy. I really do hope you've done that. And if you haven't done that, please don't leave this place this morning without doing so. And if you have thanked him, but it maybe was years ago, then as we come to Gethsemane again, let's thank him again and again and again. Let's pause for a moment and we'll pray together. Our leaders in a short prayer, which you might in the silence of your own heart want to make your own. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for your redeeming love which took you to the cross to pay the price of my sin and that despite my worthlessness I can claim your free and full forgiveness. Amen.